we're very pleased to uh, to invite Robert Lutz um, to the artist talk this evening. He's a professor at UVic. Um, he's, he's going to uh, talk about his piece and more and other works um, launching off from the three dimensional pieces through the looking, enter the looking glass exhibit. Uh, please feel free if you haven't seen the exhibit yet to um, roam around and check it out. And um, Yutz, if you don't know Yutz, uh, he holds an MFA, MFA from the York University and a BFA from the University of Victoria, uh, where he's a professor of painting. His recent solo shows include Late Daylight, 330 grams of gallery as in Saskatoon and Saskatchewan. Handmade Ultramarine Manta, the Diaz Contemporary in Toronto, Ontario, and Beautiful, Beautiful Artificial Field Art Gallery at the Kieran Art Gallery in Victoria, Victoria as well. So I look forward to hearing what he tends to say. The title of this talk is Now is Not the Time. Um, okay. with the present 
is complex. Um, you know, it has long sociological, cultural uh, reasons why we're obsessed with the present. And they can be attributed to new forms of technology, perhaps. Certainly the last hundred years of, of accelerated technology. So um, I don't, I'm, this isn't a, a kind of a Luddite attack on technology. I, I, I love technology like the next person. And I, I like te technology's application in art. But uh, it has a way, technology has a way of, as you all know very well, you don't need me to tell you about that, as a, uh, usurping everything else and uh, kind of preoccupying you in a, a kind of artificial moment. And um, that's not my, what my work's about. And it's not what my interests are about. Um, if I, as Sheila mentioned, the name of the talk is Now, now is Not the Time. Um, but I could have just as easily uh, called the talk um, Past, Present, Future, and Not in That Order. Uh, um, you know, um, but I gave it this time. Um, but really, uh, what I'm on about is a, a kind of notion of extended, extended time and multiple time by which we all live in, in, as humans. Um, a kind of, as you can see, uh, uh, up on the screen is a kind of classic New Yorker uh, cartoon, instantaneously funny and ins instantaneously cryptic and puzzled. Uh, I like the complexity of, of that scenario. Um, I also like the way that it, uh, as an image, highlights really succinctly uh, the nature of a kind of recreational behavior when uh, your mind is free when you're on holidays, as many of you know, or taking a long shower or taking a walk, the inhibitors, the neuro inhibitors in your mind or in your brain are loosened off and you start to dream and associate more broadly. That's uh, a condition that's not unique to my work, but it's certainly a condition uh, that I'm interested in uh, raising as a possibility when I talk about now, not being time. We do have the line. Um, this talk is uh, an attempt to animate for you some ideas that have uh, been resident in my work for many years. At the center of these ideas is this kind of restless fascination with the realm between uh, the aesthetic and the spectatorial, or I've said another way, between perception and time. Um, along with these, I would also add the belief and pursuit of silence and aura, yes, aura in art. Uh, something that um, the theorist scholar of Walter Benjamin wrote extensively about uh, in his early years of writing um, that was seldom acknowledged by philosophers for a lot of political reasons because it was easier to write out the notion of what aura is in, in order to justify the age of mechanical reproduction where where uh, is used to kind of promote change, notions of changing aesthetics vis-a-vis -vis through technology.
sort of partitioning of the present. That's how I like to refer to it. Um, now it's a, that's a sort of fancy way of saying disrupt, disrupting the everyday. Um, and to make the case um, again, certainly in this presentation, to make the case against uh, historical constructs, which so often rely on restrictive mythological categories. Now, for example, what a painting is and has been, what a sculpture is and has been. That's not interesting to me, and I don't think it's helpful in general. Um, um, and also, art history's tendency to use uh, biological metaphors of growth and progress to justify certain stories around art practice. Works in, uh, um, the works in this visual presentation aren't ordered in a chronological order, but are put together in a, a based on aesthetic criteria and not linear chronology. So uh, it's not my first work. In fact, I don't know where I actually started. From. No, nervous moment. Um, for me, at least, uh, temporarily, I want to avoid the culturally constructed obsession for reading and naming the kind of omni present and follow the path of inquiry set down in the 60s by the uh, significant, important anthropologist George Kugler, uh, most particularly in his book, The Shape of Time. In short, he introduced ideas in which artists um, such as Robert Smithson, Donald Judd, among many others, uh, he, he had helped them uh, or led them his writings and his thoughts led them to kind of compelling new ways of thinking about historical time and a radical rejection of a linear art history. Um, Kugler uh, wrote this, every action is more intermittent than it is continuous, and the integrals of <coughs> actions are infinitely variable in duration and content. I'll read that again, because it's quite a mouthful. Every action is more intermittent and it is continuous, and the intervals between actions are infinitely variable in duration and content. Um, quoting uh, from the author Pamela Lee in her book, uh, Chronophobia, she says this about Kugler's writings. This intermittent, even disjunctive theory of history was explained through the intertwined concepts of the form class, the closed series, and the open sequence. Uh, for Kugler, the peculiar organization of these terms underscored the unevenness of historical development and the lurching and halting of artistic problems throughout time writ large against the broad, seemingly random swatch of material culture. It's, uh, it's, archaeologic. it's an archaeologist speak. It's, it's kind of complex. It's kind of really, um, and this book of Kugler, if any of you haven't read it, was sort of the it was the book to read, in the, uh, certainly in the late 60s, and certainly in the 70s when I, I was a student. It was uh, a popular text, along with a handful of others. Um, but it, it came, it was quickly embraced by a lot of artists, but rejected, as often the case, with specialized knowledge, and rejected by many of the anthropologists within Kubu's field. <laughs> Just the way things seem to go. Um, as I preface, uh, this isn't uh, an art history lesson. I'm not uh, even capable of delivering perhaps on that level, but um, rather I'm selecting images based on a kind of an, uh, an aesthetic um, and philosophical moment I've had through connecting with the works I'm showing you. So most of the things that I'm showing you are not the only works that I like. They're just uh, convenient to my uh, positioning tonight. But in most cases, there are works um, that I've experienced directly. And they've gotten underneath my skin and messed me up and uh, turned me into the product that I am. Product. Uh, I first saw this piece in our Futurist show in Milan. Uh, a couple of years ago, and of course I knew, I knew of it, um, but 
um, I still haven't been able to get it out of my head. It, for me, it's a breakthrough work. Um, heart sculpture, heart picture. In my view, um, it's a piece that doesn't settle. In its construction, it moves us economically towards its subject, then it casts us back into the world of objects, and then perhaps, like a good poem, returns us back again to the material proposition before our eyes. I think this work successfully demonstrates the challenge of navigating the realm of aesthetics and the spectatorial. Um, in this realm, uh, speak and textual meaning, while not dominant, uh, is not laid entirely submissive to the illusory materiality and the power of the object either. No, not at all. The richness of content is released in time and shared with the recipient as the form seemingly turns infinitely in the future. Here, uh, Ossioni uh, makes use of light child to reduce motion of form and dynamic force, freeing the viewer from the tether of appearance alone. This work is in the exhibition, and it's uh, been given a temporary name of either Trio D or Trio Dumb, I'm not sure. And I'm not sure that I even approve. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> but on the other hand, I, I like to see, think of myself as flexible. Usually when I've let go of control, in my experience of letting go of control, I've learned uh, something not only about myself, but the limitations of my own work and my expectations around it. So this summer I let go again. Uh, it's, letting go isn't always a, a great thing, and I do have some reservations about um, the works being referred to and referenced to, in particular, to um, Through the Looking Glass. But for your interest, this piece is called Here I Am, Say Nothing, Soft Works for Complicated Needs. 1995. Um, it's been argued that the object and its autonomy in art was once the most important achievement of modernity. Um, I have my reservations about this claim, uh, but however, I'm interested in it as a claim. Um, it's, uh, it was William, just as my knowledge serves me, it was William Tucker, British sculptor, and a uh, critic historian who um, first made that claim. Um, and he makes the claim in a book entitled The Language of Sculpture. He also goes on to say that um, by the mid 20th century, painting had aesthetically uh, exhausted itself, uh, leading to uh, the once pictorial values of painting folding into the realm of the object or the real, and uh, which with which I agree. I'm not sure about absolute statements about painting ending or sculpture ending. Or, you know, th these kinds of currencies seem largely silly to me. Uh, but uh, I think there is something in general to ruptures, such as I was referring to or referencing to with Kugler, over time, stops and starts, ruptures in this continuum. That's really important. Not only important to the uh, understanding of the art object, but our, our subconscious understanding of things and how they operate on us in the world. Something like that. Um, at this point, I just also like to acknowledge, I guess, um, these are the William Tucker, is that something that's always interested me is, uh, that's gone under my skin a little bit, was uh, synthetic cubism. And perhaps you'll see elements of that in the work that I'm showing you tonight, that it's resident in a, in a funny way. And it's partly what um, Tucker is talking about, that um, I'm 
allowing the pictorial to reach out into um, the space that we're in, to the real, um, and contaminate it. Um, and certainly that's what I think the, uh, what's happening in these soft works for complicated needs of doing. <clears throat> this one's title is, Here I Am, Forget Everything. Um, well, another aspect of these pieces is, uh, I think, obviously, hopefully, the color, and um, how color plays on, uh, it, an important role in shaping our perceptual experience. Um, as to the extension, the extension of, to as to what extent the pictorial and the illusory um, play out in real space, um, that's left kind of hanging and uh, to be determined, but it is definitely part of my uh, vocabulary that's at play here. Um, these objects have their own gestalt, for sure. Um, where, where is the real space of the object, I might ask? Um, is it what hangs before you, or simply, uh, simply a trussed up cushion, or is it beyond what you Uh, the title of this piece is called Blue Rise, 1995. The color keeps working. It's, you know, the equivalent of an ever-ready battery. Uh, the color is not subdued or contained on the wall in which the cushion is mounted. It keeps insisting we follow its path as it moves forward to the side and behind. And the recipient, the viewer, also follows the instruction of color this way. Careful, don't spill your coffee on the new sofa. Did I tie that too tight? How's that, a little better? Now, sit upright, don't slouch. That's my attempt at poetry, sorry. <laughs> Uh, you can take it that way, but it's not meant that way. 
Um, you know, um, Chamberlain and Judd were close allies, and, and Chamberlain gets a, an entire warehouse in which he um, has his work cited. And uh, this is a particular piece that called Short Stop, as it is entitled, as you can see, printing, um, that um, I think has a certain, has held a certain kind of power with me for a long time. And I think you can see the parallel uh, here in, in, between this work and my cushions. Um, when I was making the cushion, somebody was here tonight, Maury, being said to me, oh yeah, I, I get it, Chamberlain, right? I go, yeah, yeah, it's very perceptive, Maury. That's right. But he actually didn't mean to crush the cards. He meant Chamberlain's trussed up foam pieces, which at that time, I mean, that they weren't um, that well known. Uh, they had been done at, at equivalent period of time. Um, and I certainly wasn't aware of them. So I, I, liked, I liked learning that there was a kind of parallel universe out there, and that's a little bit like what I'm talking about tonight, is that there are parallel activities that don't always necessarily have to be seen in a pejorative sense um, by which we, we, we all have a kind of connectivity to it. I hope that makes sense. The other thing about this particular piece before I move on, and I probably should move on or we'll be here until midnight, is um, there's a kind of nearness in this work. So it, it involves uh, various levels of engagement. On one hand, you can say, oh yeah, it's a bit of old-fashioned formalism. It has weight, gravity, mass. But it also um, it asks you to look closely. It has this kind of um, am amazing kind of complexity where it's um, tethering line is used to or or the line is um, has this kind of secondary role as a kind of framing device but it's also a tethering device and it moves back and forth um, and that's a kind of near what I call nearness a certain a way of reading surface and not um, linguistically recognizing it as a category within our history if you understand what I'm saying uh, maybe, maybe in a minute. So, um, Duchamp. Silence. So this can be, it's quite simply, it's just silence pictorialized. You know, both. It's not radical again what I'm saying. It's both an object and a picture simultaneously. Um, it, it acknowledges uh, speak, text. It has a story to tell. But the story is restricted, which only kind of um, makes us more interested. And, um, and the story that all Duchamp's work is a riddle and metaphor and so on. But it, it's largely silent. Uh, this piece is um, shown here, I believe. Um, it's called I Can Feel the Air of Another Planet, uh, Twin Towers. It was meant to be a, an oblique reference to the trade towers. Um, it was made you know, shortly after they came down. I didn't set out to make a piece on, on that issue, uh, but in making this piece, I recognized that the geometry, uh, internal geometry of the light box system had a relationship to architecture, and I was very interested in the pictorial aspects of that, that it, it, was, it became a plate glass window or a window to look into. So it's holding the realm of conventional painting as, a, as well as being also like an appliance. It could just as easily be a, I don't know, a big refrigerator, Coca-Cola machine or something. You know, the title isn't my title, I stole it. The, the title came from a poem um, written by Stefan George, um, who uh, 
you know, that's between 1868 and 1933, and he wrote verses that the atonalist conductors were not put to music. So I'm talking about um, Schoenberg and Weber. I like the uh, I like language, uh, and I I like the way that that particular title can be read in multiple ways. It's a really, really crappy example of documentation. <laughs> you can say that with certainty. But um, it was taken with my cell phone, I think. Uh, and um, I've been meaning to get a proper documentation because the uh, National Gallery owns the piece. But I, myself, never... Um, it was one of those funny things. I'm not particularly good at looking after these kinds of matters anyhow. But um, it was one of those things that went to exhibition and, uh, and then didn't come back, something every artist likes. But uh, it didn't give me an opportunity to document it properly. You know, it's called for, its title is for everyone, A Window. And what you just saw was a compressed 30 second uh, abstract of what it might be like to see it. But the reality is, it's six minutes, and it goes from uh, a sort of fictionalized uh, daylight to night. And it takes you through that uh, very, on very slow uh, light changes. It's an LED system that's kind of programmed. Um, but um, here, you know, you're just you're getting what you're getting. Uh, that's a better picture of it. So um, obviously, I think that along with this, the uh, sort of mechanics of this extended time, six minutes, you're also getting this uh, light contamination in the room, and um, all of which I, I is maybe I'm stating the obvious, but it is a part of the uh, experiential condition which is um, considered in the work. Um, arguably, one of the first uh, architects to consider the importance of light in his buildings um, was an architect by the name of Scamozzi. Um, and uh, this is, um, I know this from his writings uh, 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 entitled uh, Idea della Architectura Univers Universale, uh, 1615, pardon my attempt at that. Um, um, uh, Scabosi made a case for distinguishing different kinds of light. He reasoned that uh, natural light is one thing, but due to varying circumstances, it can change in major ways that we shall do. And um, so he decided to distinguish what those were in six ways. Strong or celestial light, direct light, side light, restricted light, reflected light, minimal or residual light. By today's standards, you might think of um, uh, the great modernist Corbusier's uh, many musings on windows, which involve notions of uh, natural light and how we, live, uh, how we should live uh, with it. Um, or somebody like Richard Meyer, the American architect, for his ability to capitalize on natural light in the built space. Or even um, more current, um, the phenomenological um, architect, or um, Jean Nouvel. So when I'm telling you this uh, story, I'm, I'm, I'm deliberately point, I'm spreading out the notion uh, um, of, of something as ordinary as life, how that has sustained artists' interests. Um, since the beginning of time, and 
I'm, um, I'm, I'm making a case for that, like Googler, I'm trying to make a case for that, like Googler, that it, it, it doesn't exhaust itself. These possibilities are always potentially renewable. Um, the title of this work is Seeing You, Seeing yeah, Color Wheel 2011, and anybody who frequents Toronto can see this in the uh, downtown RBC building. But um, the, the, the idea is, well, on one hand, it may appear to be a bit of a trinket. Uh, this space that it occupies is a... Um, a glazed in cube, a little atrium, but uh, it's used for people uh, waiting for their rides, getting off work, coming to work, and they, they go into the space and uh, make their cell phone calls and so on and so forth. So I wanted to make something that registered somewhat aggressively through the use of color, that sort of dynamic, um, you know, playful way in the space, where it's so hypothetically by morning, you're going to see a certain kind of behavior out of this piece, and in the evening, you're going to see it differently under artificial light. Um, this piece, I'm not showing that it's optimum. Um, it's entitled Jesus Green to Fino Sunset, 2009, and it, it also is a uh, LED driven uh, work where the technology is embedded in the piece. So what you're seeing is just a, a set of lights going on and off, like perhaps uh, the light coming in from your bedroom window, uh, but it hold, holds your gaze. Uh, there's something uh, of the power of that um, orchestration uh, that has um, um, kind of interesting, maybe even primal power. Giacomo uh, Bala's The uh, Street, 1909. I think it sort of speaks for itself. Uh, this is a project I did in London, Ontario. Um, I don't know the year, maybe three or four years ago. Um, the piece is called Another Appearance Made Visible. Um, in, done in Victoria Park, where I had um, the curator of the exhibition. I did two exhibitions, one solo show of uh, object-based work, but also this outdoor piece where I had them change up uh, all the lamps in the public park um, so and they were all changed to um, represent the um, seven colors um, that we can perceive uh, red yellow green blue orange violet and indigo sometimes Uh, by the way, you can stop me any time, uh, um, if you like, or we can just continue. Um, I don't really have anything to say about this photograph. I think it's self-explanatory when we see the next one, but I have to say I love artists' uh, portraits because often it's a controlled uh, construction. That there's a story just in that alone. And uh, I think that's where anybody here working on a PhD, perhaps maybe they'd like to follow that up. But I think there's a lot to that kind of staging of the self. And this uh, tells a lot, I think, about um, Michael Heiser. Was that one in the exhibit? No, it's not, no. No, um, he's an American uh, artist who 
was a father was an archaeologist and uh, he, he was one of people associated with the land earth art movement in the 60s. So this is his piece at uh, Via Beacon in New York, upstate New York. Uh, and what he was holding in that image was, of course, the model for this. And the reason I'm showing it is a piece that I'm, I've experienced you know, many times. And um, it's a lovely uh, piece. Uh, for its complexity, for its silence, for its withholding, for its um, ability to withhold and, and for you not to know. You can, it's like, uh, as abstract as kind of considering the cosmos or something. There's only a certain amount of uh, actual information that you can access, that you can get a handle on. The rest is unknown. Robert, those, those, that's just not flat. Those so are 3D. They're like in the ground. Those are holes actually holes. In, into the ground. Yeah. So that's basically what you're holding. It's like that. But you don't have access. And there are uh, guided tours that you can have where you're actually led up to the edge of those works. But for the most part, people encounter them being held back by a uh, glass in wall. Uh, this is my, my work, it's called Plato's Cave, uh, 2005. And uh, it's another light, obviously, light-based piece that uh, goes through this set of uh, change-ups. Um, the, what appears to be in this image uh, as white tubes, uh, those white tubes are mounted on uh, a plexiglass box, not just a plane, but a box that has depth um, with a, a fan system mounted on it. And those tubes go, are color changers, they chase, they color chase, they're changing all the while. Um, and uh, that's a difficult thing to uh, record, to photographically record. Um, as well as that, it, there is a uh, external component which is a theatrical light um, that projects onto this piece. So you get this intersection of um, systems, if you will, overlapping. And um, you uh, are, I think, en enchanted, at least briefly, by the dynamic of that change up. Um, and some things that you like, maybe Heiser before, uh, some things you, you can't entirely um, hold on to in terms of where it's happening, how it's happening. It's outside of your immediate comprehension. Um, okay, I'm getting there. Um, Dan Flavin, Flavin. Um, Martha, again, uh, Texas, where um, you can see by the date here, uh, 1996 to 2000. It didn't take that long to actually realize, but there was, I mean, this is a little kind of backstory, if you will. I mean, there was a Judd and Flavin, a uh, long time ally, artistic friends, had a falling out, and the work wasn't realized until in 2000. Um, but what it is, is, is a, Martha, Texas is a decommissioned. Uh, uh, one time army base, and uh, on this base are many uh, structures which our art is um, housed uh, to the specifications of an artist. So here's Flav and Flav, sorry, I always do that. Um, uh, um, he plays with, I think, four or five um, small architectural spaces um, um, with light. It's kind of fun. Technology is kind of fun. I, I see um, this shouldn't concern you, but I'm going to come clean. But whatever notes I had were washed out at the start of the um, lecture, and I hope 
it's one thing to another. For some reason, it stole my text. So uh, that's okay. <coughs> But why, why, why Thaven um, uh, is that I, uh, obviously I feel, you know, uh, you know, he's the forerunner in terms of some of what my interests are. But the, uh, one of the things about the minimalists um, is that uh, they, sort of one of their uh, slogans was that their work was about the everyday uh, about um, sourcing materials from the world that we inhabit and putting putting them to task, which of course Haven, Judd, and many others do brilliantly. But there's a problem um, which is more than apparent the minute you step in the room with these works, and is that they are more than the everyday. Uh, that they uh, they invite such kind of complex perceptual conditions that it, the world that you know or think you know is pulled out from under your feet. And here, in this image, that's a picture of me. Talk about constructing identity. Um, uh, looking through the uh, fixtures as they're installed on a diagonal and the, the beauty here is that you're in the room with the color, which is fixed, it's not changing, uh, but you're also seeing through that color to another colored room. And um, while that sounds a lot easier for me in my use, or a lot easier to understand as a description, it's not uh, perceptually uh, easy to process in the moment. And I think that your, your mind isn't, uh, everywhere but the everyday. No text. Oh well. Um, everybody knows this picture. And um, what I would say about this picture is it's, uh, I'm fond of it. Uh, I think it's an interesting work. Probably for its uh, largely because of its economy, uh, what you're what you're looking at, um, uh, it represents a, a kind of spirit of modernity, a vista viewing through. Yet, so it has that hold uh, in terms of our comprehension, but it also um, is uh, slightly conventional uh, that it points back to the 19th century in its uh, application pictorially, uh, compositionally. But it's also very, very contemporary. Uh, it, I also like its silence. I like the fact that this painting was made in 1942, which apparently was, and it was made um, just shortly after Pearl Harbor was um, attacked. And um, I mean, it's speculated, and it's never been, it was never uh, acknowledged uh, by Hopper that. Um, that, that, that sort of psychology of, um, was um, sort of can be tied to um, looking at these people sort of in isolation in a socialized context and in, a, in an artificially lit context, which interests me, the urban field, this, this kind of system, this grid of lights and walls that we um, live in daily. Um, this is a piece made in 2011 entitled Turn On Your Electric. Um, well, hopefully you can see the parallel to um, the Hopper piece. Um, but I'm showing you uh, the piece because one of the things I like to do, which I think again is unusual, but I, I make work and I exhibit work and I change my mind about work. And I exhibit again, and I, I'm not having made changes. So the next image you're going to see an older piece. And um, uh, this particular piece I made for the Diaz Contemporary Gallery in Toronto um, 
knowing that this uh, back gallery of theirs has some clear story windows that at roughly uh, noon, there's this beautiful uh, cast of light, the harsh light that comes through and catches right in the back side of this room. And I really wanted to capitalize on that. And, and I thought this piece would be a nice collector for that. So that rather than me imposing a lighting system into it, I was working with what was available. And it did kind of work out, but I changed my mind. Uh, so I showed it again here uh, in, uh, the, at the Deluge Gallery uh, downtown, Deborah Dvor's uh, little space, where, um, you know, it's a less than pure, what we call less than white cube scenario. Uh, lots of issues, uh, um, you know, in this case, back windows, uh, very tight showing parameters. Um, but I... Uh, Anticipating that, I, I chose to put a lighting system inside, and you can also see an old surfboard, um, my son's, in there. And uh, um, that partly came about from a desire of having something to look at. Um, um, and, you know, that's the state it, it, it resides in now. It, I think it's still up at the Bank of Art Gallery. Um, they, they own that. They own that. So I guess I can't do anything about it now. Um, as I said, my text got eliminated, so I can't name, remember the name of this cave, but it's a cave I've been in, in uh, um, Andalusia area, uh, just south of Rona, Spain. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's one of those experiences that, as an artist, has just stuck with me. Um, the profundity of looking at uh, uh, drawings done by, uh, you know, Neolithic drawings, um, uh, done 20,000, perhaps 25,000 years ago. If you get a chance, I'd recommend it. Uh, there's something so powerfully direct about the drawings, but also uh, the rudimentary nature of the, the, the communicative uh, form, try, um, early form of consciousness that appeals to me. Anyhow, in this particular cave, it's owned by uh, a local family in Hessen. It's their bread and butter. It has been their family bread and butter for years and years and years. It's not run by us, you know, um, a park system or the government. And so when you visit this cave, I wish I could tell you the name, but you can always email me if you want. Um, you are led by lantern, whole lantern, for um, I'd say half a mile through the cave with an old man with his lantern uh, pointing out various highlights. And uh, I don't know, can't get it out of my head. Uh, so I like to call uh, this image caves, casinos, condos, and the shape of time. Now in this cave there's all sorts of uh, demarcation, but the clearest forms um, are, are renderings of uh, fish, horses, uh, um, and lots of these beautiful jade pools that are uh, magical. And uh, I like a little magic. So there's an example. Um, I know it's a long time to sit, so I'll, I'll speed it along because uh, it's a, a, an hour is almost enough, right? So I'll start speeding up here a little bit. But here's some uh, recent paintings of mine. I trained as a painter, um, and I haven't, by any measure, given up on painting. I like, I like painting. Uh, so I move um, back and forth through methodologies. I don't like to be restricted by them. I, I even have been, I feel awkward, because in one hand I wear a hat where people um, 
introduced me as a painter. Uh, he teaches at UVic, and it's true enough, I teach painting at UVic. But it's also slightly humorous to me because certainly for the past 15 to 20 years I've made nothing but objects. But those objects that I make always, as part of the point of this presentation, are always tied to the pictorial. I'm always thinking of painting. It's in my DNA now. Uh, so I don't really mind. I don't mind the title, but I don't like to be tethered by it either. So this piece is called uh, Handmade Ultramarine Mantra, uh, Lauren Harris Shelter. And uh, they do, it does come literally uh, out of thinking about my experience in caves. I wanted to, uh, the backstory here is I got asked to do a commission in uh, a Mies van der Rohe uh, building, downtown Toronto, one of the TV towers. And I wanted to do, uh, they wanted me to do a light-based piece and I didn't want to and for reasons that are quite long and convoluted but the short of it is I wanted to make some paintings and um, uh, I really wanted to make some paintings that had at their core a, a, a modernist condition at the same time, same time something that echoed back to the beginning of mark making so the stencil uh, as in um, the paintings as we know them of the directness of that. So what these are is a, a, a piece of two by four cedar just painted and then printed onto canvas. Uh, I, I stamp it on in a really primitive way, uh, which I, I think sometimes there should be a video of. I take a, a sledgehammer and I just hit it. <laughs> sometimes it comes back at me. Um, Part of my interest in, when I use the term nearness, it's a Habermas, a uh, German philosopher's term, like world. And it's about a uh, uh, nature of changing technology that he's um, using on and feels that the more we, our lives are dominated by technology, this is really reductive what I'm saying here, but bear with me, the more that we're, our lives are kind of usurped by, dominated by technology, uh, it, as technology brings everything closer, that's its great benefit. We know more about the world, perhaps, in some ways than we ever had. But we also lose a sense of nearness. And so nearness is, um, not because he wrote that, but, but, but I think nearness is a really interesting subject. I think it helps to set um, initial uh, issue, uh, subject around boundaries and surface. And um, anyhow, I'm telling you because it interests me. This piece is called Handmade Ultramarine Mantra, uh, Tom's Cabin. The nearness part of these is I'm deliberately referencing the earlier Canadian Romanticism, the group of seven. Um, seeing Emily Carr's retreat. Emily Carr is popular here in Victoria. Here. <laughs> um, the title of this piece is called She, Him, 1998. Uh, I, I like the way that first things and last things all happen at once. That the curve of time here is infinite. That these are, uh, what they are is, what I call them as thread paintings, and they are literally just thread that I've immersed in paint and strung out, sort of like the you know, shroud of Jesus. <laughs> I know. Uh, this is a picture of them. That both of those are my works at, at Site Santa Fe in Mexico, and a show called Postmark in uh, 1990. And it's uh, a set of light works. Uh, these lights, which I kind of euphemistically refer to as um, shop uh, Mondrian's for a shopping mall. Uh, they are very much uh, a kind of contemporary technology, a, a signboard, if you like. And I, I, I like the idea of uh, meshing the two relationships, uh, the two kinds of contrasts. So now if you think about how I preface the presentation with the comic, that there are these kind of oppositional forces at play culturally that interest me. Um, Here's a building, uh, Yale University campus, um, built in 1963. Uh, 
by the great modernist uh, company Skidmore Owings in Merrill and the architects Gordon Bunchoff, or Bunchoff, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. And what I like about it is it's both part neoclassical form, part modernist rationalism, um, part neolithic cave. It's a kind of interesting integration between, interesting between functionalism um, and aesthetic aura where books and building combined create a powerful yet silent, uh, yet material, experiential condition for the visitor. That's the inside shot, uh, shot of the stacks. So you see what I mean, that the stacks become a kind of visual picture, that the book takes on a more larger than its texts. It's a beautiful building. And one of the things uh, that's so uh, uh, mind-blowing is that um, the window, which is that corded outer membrane that you're seeing, is um, made of uh, gray, white, veined marble. And it's translucent. It's an inch and a quarter thick. And so the light into that space is through the marble. Uh, it's uh, like... Uh, is that uh, That's New Haven, Yale University. Yes, right. Yeah. Yeah, go go if you get a chance because it, it it's a reminder that again that we live in multiple times that we, we our memory is longer than we know. So that that's what it looks like. It's sort of deadened. <laughs> um, Giorgio Morandi, I, I don't know if I need to say much. I, I, I'll move along. Uh, you'll see the connection. This is a set of light boxes I did in 2006. This is Friday. This is Saturday. This is what Sunday looks like. Um, the idea was to uh, make a inverted picture it's inverted in that that what when you look at it you're seeing on the surface you're seeing an image like a still like in composition say like Morandi who I admire uh, but uh, you but it's the inverted part or reverse combine I like to say it's like a Rauschenberg it's pieced together with literally garbage uh, inside and that and that that's that transformation becomes its richness when you receive it from external. And that kind of uh, ambiguity, again, of encounter um, is what other? This piece is entitled Wood is Resilient, Resilient in Earthquakes, 2012. It falls in a similar rubric for me. I guess you've never seen this before, right? <laughs> This is like an art, art professor's cliche. <laughs> it's a great painting, and of course it's a great painting. And so um, I'm sorry, Mr. Matisse. Uh, it's a, a wonderful painting um, because it, um, I'm dumbing things down, but because it simply animates uh, the room without ever uh, disclosing the room. This doesn't, he doesn't paint the walls, he paints red. But also because the painting, um, at one point in its developmental curve, uh, from you know, being yellow, being green, became a red painting. And at that, at that point that it worked. And I'm interested in, in the phenomena of why that happens. And obviously, um, not to go on about that because we're short of time, but what, what's important is that this painting inspires uh, all the rest of modernity, particularly painting, particularly abstract expressionism in New York. That uh, a painting can that a painting can be a pictorial event that works through iconicity, the staging of increments in it, but it can also be more expansive. It can be both in the room in your presence that it projects, but it also can contain an internal matrix. That's interesting. Um, here's another, this is like Ruff's road tour. Um, 
Uh, this is um, St. Ives, England, and this is the studio of Barbara Kepler. And I, I uh, since I'm allowing myself to be a little selfless, uh, I, uh, I included it because it's a kind of mag I think it has a magical parallel to the image I just showed you. That an assortment of things in a space in time, none of which are of particular interest to me when I view this room, but the room is kind of magical. In her compound in St. Ives, and I encourage you all to go there, she, lives, she lived in a stone house. And then she had a stone walled, uh, excuse me, compound. Uh, where she had this most magical garden and in uh, all these out, stone outposts where she worked at different points in the day. This isn't necessarily an unusual story for an artist, but it's a measure of time that I think is a lovely thing. So you can go from one carving shed, so to speak, to the next, uh, to another shed where she, and I'll show you in a moment, where she takes naps in the garden. And I see all this kind of orchestration as um, powerful. So it's a sort of a, a material vernacular of objects in the room, I call it. So that's a little bit of her garden, some of her pieces. Another, another studio. So these are these things apparently are left the way they, she, they were when she was working on them. She died. Right? She was elderly, I don't know the details, she fell over and died. It tends to happen. <laughs> well, I think it's probably a good way. Um, you know, start to think about those things. Ah, there's her show. So, um, this piece is called Look Out Your Window, Time Must Have a Stop, 2009. It's about stations of looking and moving through space. This piece is called The Last Time We Stayed, uh, Time Must Have a Stop, 2009. This is a piece that I'm, I'm sticking in. Um, don't worry, we're getting close here. Uh, this is a piece I'm sticking in simply because I'm doing it again. It's a piece from uh, probably six or so years ago. And um, I rejected it at the time. And I'm now in the process of kind of building a piece or pieces like it again. And um, I think that that's an important thing to promote or to come clean about. And it, I think it fits with my uh, interest in stops and starts and ruptures of time. Um, you know, it, it's a barrel that projects uh, a picture of a spinning disc. You can sort of just partially see it on the back wall. It, project, it projects this spinning light on the wall. Um, Urban Tribe. Here's a quick little movie. Uh, room upgrade for Pacific Northwest. 2012, this piece just helped me with. Um, <clears throat> again, road pictures. This is in Lucan, Italy. Uh, watch. Want to see that again? <laughs> Backwards. Forward. Uh, so, uh, sequence. I like sequence. Um, I probably have more to say about that, but that would be shorthand. <laughs> um, so, sequence, uh, repetition, uh, all part of this incomplete partitioning of the everyday that interests me. When things linguistically make themselves, declare themselves to you only to be undermined by um, another move or a repetition. In this case, what you're looking at is Don Judd's kitchen. And there's something kind of beautiful that undermines the everyday 
nature of a stove and cooking, when you see three simultaneously, don't you think? I don't know, I do anything. Uh, dirty words, salt air, breath, and all your day night changes, sequence. Um, your constant waterfall, uh, Denman, Bowen, Galliano. It's a little uh, nod to nearness. Uh, a little bit of local geography. There are other reasons behind this work that I'm going to now for going on long. Um, simply, these works, and I'll show you in a second, these works uh, are uh, self-activated. They're on uh, bairns. So the tondos, when you touch them, spin. Uh, and the bairns are so good, for those of you who know about skateboarding, uh, that when you touch it, this thing goes and goes and goes and goes. And uh, I want to show these at the Diaz Contemporary Gallery. Um, people were interested in them, but once they caught on that they could spin them, it, it, it totally killed the rest of the work. People were coming in, it sort of got out on the street, so to speak, and coming in and they forget the rest of the show and they go to the back gallery and spin these pieces. <laughs> Beware of movement. So this is an exhibition they were showing called Rewild, Rewilding Modernity at the Mendel Art Gallery in Saskatoon last fall. The title, um, uh, it was curated by the former curator here, uh, Lisa Bolasera, and I assisted her in, in titling the exhibition, which included a lot of artists, so it wasn't about me. Uh, but the title was something that I stole from an article in the New Yorker, which is a concept I'm really interested in, is, is rewilding what that means, um, this kind of idea of artificially resuscitating history. And I won't go into that either because that's a whole long other topic, but I'll leave you with that. I'll share it with you another time. So I am literally almost at the end. I just stuck this in for its humor. I like the contamination of this. This was... Um, a set of houses uh, down in Texas, uh, Judd inspired. That's not Don Judd's work. That's just funky interpretation. And uh, I like that kind of uh, breakdown, you might call a kind of vernacular application, whether it's in architecture, whether it's in painting, whether it's in sculpture. Uh, it's what uh, kind of I, drives me. Now, I'm just going to conclude this evening uh, by showing you um, what I'm working on or, or is being worked on for a show at the Bank of Art Gallery um, at their offsite um, on Georgia at the bottom of the Shangri-La Hotel. They have a project space, which is a reflecting pool where they commission artists uh, to do an outdoor piece. So what you're looking at um, is a structure, a very basic um, Sketch up schematic of a piece that is uh, 12 feet tall by 10 feet wide by about 30 feet long. And um, each one of these chambers um, is, uh, holds uh, salvage glass that's leaning against a set of aluminum window frames. And in that salvage glass, there are like eccentric shapes and cuts of re rejected um, material. Not all of it's 100% rejected. Some of it uh, I am purchasing. Uh, some of it's uh, colored glass. Some of it, a lot, most of it is uh, salvage. Um, there's also a lighting system that runs through uh, this work, uh, neon lights, so that it has um, the possibility of being viewed under multiple conditions. Obviously, by daylight, what's going to happen is the structure, hopefully, anyhow, it's all hypothetical, so it happens, uh, that the structure um, kind of cascades into the reflecting pond, that its, its form, it loses its form, its architecture, if you will, and um, that's a conceit, because it's not much of an architecture, but that it loses its form and it comes apart, that, that the glass catches the reflection of its context 
and mirrors that back to you, the viewer, but also it, that uh, experience is uh, reflected into the reflecting pond. And just another, sh another shot of that. And so the neon lights, you can't see in these drawings, but the neon lights are following all of, uh, the various planes of those um, windows, vertical window sets um, throughout. Um, uh, for me, it, it, the piece is um, a bit of a kind of Homeric catalog, uh, a listing of history, uh, a reference to history without relying on the kind of didactic or um, easily identified history of a kind of na uh, changing nature of um, the material urban world that um, most of us live in. Um, um, it's a kind of, re it's a it's a build and rebuild scenario that you're looking at time like an archaeologist here stored um, in these rafters. So uh, thanks a lot. Resurrection of time, that's your main 
Steam. Um, at the moment. I read the New Yorker article. I mean, actually, they should have mentioned Bruce. I have a shirt that I'm very good as well as the guy who got it from me. But I thought it was very interesting. I read that as. Oh, I'm sorry, what did you mean? Bruce. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I think mean, that's exactly where the New Yorker got it. Ah, but right. it's very interesting because apparently it's actually here that recognizes your work. That um, is you know, I can't say forever. I mean, I'm not getting into my history, not. but currently. The multiple times yeah. that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, 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 I think that I recognize. I think that all artists do this. You recognize aspects of your work that were there over time and you you learn to capitalize on that as you evolve. I mean, it's not exactly lying. Sometimes we say we lie. But I, I don't think it is. It's, you know, it's pro part of a process of digesting that and recognizing um, the, the, the vocabulary that you've been putting to task. And the mysterious, mysterious approach of Giorgio Morandi, yeah. What you on the I like him because he's a contradiction. Mysterious. He, he's on one hand is easy to like and he will be easy to reject. I like that. Because it is so conventional, but yet here he is, a guy who spent his entire life hold hold up in his um, mother's flat, I think, uh, yeah. in Bologna, painting the same dozen vases, I may be exaggerating, his entire life. I can't think of a more systemized approach to painting, mechanical, that isn't